Thank you so much, Dr. Model. Um, a, a, an incredibly inspiring presentation. As, as I mentioned earlier, you never cease to amaze me um, and inspire me to do what I can for people with MS in terms of exercise. And as I mentioned, you are the consummate mentor, teacher, leader. Um, everywhere he goes, he brings his students, his colleagues, his postdocs, his fellows, um, because he is actively involved on a daily basis in making sure that the next generation of MS researchers is continuing to be developed. So thank you so much for that. At this point, we're going to ask that you, um, if you haven't already done so, to write your questions down and to simply hold them up or wave them in the air. We have many of our wonderful NMSS volunteers roaming around in the room who will be happy to pick up these cards from you. Um, and I will do my best to uh, get to as many of them as I can. At this point, I would like to invite our faculty members for our uh, research panel to come on up and join us, Dr. Jackie Bernard, Dr. Daniel Wynn, and Dr. Susan Rubin. And I'd personally like to thank all three of these folks for participating in our panel discussion today. All of them are members of the uh, Professional Advisory Committee, the Clinical Advisory Committee for the um, Illinois chapter. So I'll start off to my immediate right, um, who is Dr. Susan Rubin. She's a neurologist at um, the North Shore University Health System and serves as the director of the Women's Neurology Center at Glenbrook Hospital. Again, you can read more about her bio as well as um, others in the program booklet. To her right is Dr. Jackie Bernard, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Neurology at the University of Chicago. And she has a special interest in MS in the Hispanic population and has been working on developing outreach initiatives. To Dr. Bernard's right is Dr. Daniel Wynn, who is the Director of Clinical Research for Consultants in Neurology, as well as the co-director of the MS Center which is designated by the NMSS as a comprehensive center for MS care, and to his right, again, Dr. Model. Um, so uh, while we're gathering additional questions, um, I would like to um, ask the panel as a group, and anybody that can would could answer this. I know. Um, that I am as guilty as everyone else about not keeping exercise first and foremost in my mind when it comes to uh, people with MS. It sometimes seems like that 20 minute visit when my patients have a list of six or eight or 10 problems that we want to address exercise if it's not first on their list is often doesn't make it into the visit. But I do know that with January coming up, I'm gonna get lots of calls from my patients. They call me asking for things like prescriptions for personal trainers, prescriptions for gym memberships, prescriptions for um, specific exercise programs. And I actually always write those prescriptions for them. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that they can get their insurance to cover the cost of a personal trainer or a gym membership, but if they provide it to their accountant, often they can use that as a medical necessity in a tax write-up. So I would encourage you to ask your healthcare provider for a script and see what you can do with it. Anybody else? No, I would agree, especially if you have a uh, health savings account. Many times that, that is a uh, approved cost through a health savings account. So we definitely encourage people to, um, to ask for those things. I also, you know, uh, very freely give out prescriptions for physical therapy. Sometimes physical therapy is a great way to get started in an exercise program if you don't know where to start to do some um, exercise with a physical therapist, figure out what, what you really need to work on, and then get a home program from them. 
I always include give a home exercise program as part of that prescription so that patients can get started with, uh, with an exercise program that's designed specifically to their needs because I, I agree that this is probably one of the most important things you can do for yourself. And if I could just add, I know Blue Cross and there might be other insurers that have wellness programs that they um, subsidize. So if you go to the wellness program on the Blue Cross website, you can find that for $25 a month, you can have a membership to a number of health clubs around the metro area. Um, so this is a perfect time to, to look into that and get your winter exercise plan set up. Uh, one common issue that we hear is trouble getting to a place where I can exercise. So two things, of course, the county and the city has uh, transportation where people who are transportationally challenged can no longer drive anymore to get to places where they can exercise. And again, we're involved with Dr. Modal in developing and customizing an exercise program for each individual with a message of different stages of the disease so you can find that exercise program will work just for you. And of course, in the long run, exercise is probably the most cost-effective treatment for MS. So one of our first questions is, as we'll move on, because we have quite, quite, the, <laughs> quite the list of questions, which is great. Keep them yeah. coming. Um, this one I'll address to Dr. Model. Does physical therapy for patients with progressive MS and in a wheelchair have similar positive effects to those that can go for a walk? Ooh, that... Uh, that's a great question. Um, I, I think in theory they do, but the actual evidence on comparing those different uh, approaches to managing multiple sclerosis hasn't been directly studied. And I think that there is a lot of interest in studying uh, the specific development of exercise programs that focus on walking in progressive disease. And I think once we start to develop those programs that are actually reasonably delivered programs, then we can start looking at the effects of uh, these exercise programs compared against physical therapy as more of a holistic, maybe, approach to managing consequences of MS. So we're not there yet. Great. Um, Dr. Wynn, I'll address the next question to you. If my MRI shows no change, why am I clinically getting worse? So there are lots of reasons why people may be clinically getting worse in the absence of a change in MRI scan. One, if you had an MRI scan of your brain and you have new lesions in your spinal cord, that may explain why a person has, for example, worse trouble ambulating. Two, as to tie into what Dr. Model was talking about earlier is one of the worst kinds of weakness in MS is simply deconditioning weakness. And again, you simply become deconditioned, you stop exercising, that typically is not gonna show an obvious new lesion on your MRI scan. Uh, one very common symptom in MS is depression. Um, again, that will often lead to decreasing exercise as well, but not a typical lesion change on the MRI scan. Three, depending on who is reading your MRI scan, if they're Sometimes a neuroradiologist will read it, and sometimes the colon x-ray radiologist read it, or sometimes the neuroradiologist reads it five minutes after their spouse calls. If you're not home in three minutes, I'm throwing your clothes in the lawn. So again, we want you to have your healthcare provider look at the MRI scan with you and really get a sense, do they think it's changed from the previous one? And also try to get a high quality image so that we get the most information. Great, thank you. I, just, I was just gonna add that also, we, do, um, we don't show progression well on MRI, and so even if you're not having acute lesions and acute relapses, you can still have progressive changes, and um, if they're not looking for atrophy or shrinkage of the brain over time, that sometimes can be missed or it can be subtle, but um, those changes can be occurring even when we're not seeing distinct changes on the MRI, so that can be a reason also. And if I could just add one more thing, one thing you're going to hear much more about uh, going forward is the concept of comorbidity in multiple sclerosis. So, you know, MS is a hobby you didn't want to have, but additionally you have your health in general to, to be proactive about. And so things like chronic venous changes in your lower extremities or heart disease, things like that could also affect how you're feeling in addition to the things that Dr. Rubin and Dr. Wynn ha have mentioned. So there are other comorbidities besides MS that can contribute to not feeling like you're getting better. 
So the next question um, for anyone that would like it is, do, do exercise studies show a positive effect on vitamin D absorption? And what are your recommendations for vitamin D? <laughs> they all look at me like, Kinesiology yeah. <laughs> translates into to the nutraceuticals. Well, I, I can tell you, if you exercise outdoors in the sunshine, you'll have greater <laughs> absorption of vitamin D. That's pretty right. clear. Right. So right. I would recommend right. that. Uh, and, and, and thanks for stealing my thunder, Dan. Uh, uh, in fact, we, we had a, a conversation about this many years ago um, at the National MS Society in, in New York on a, a live telecast where... Um, one of the other panelists recommended exercising naked. <laughs> <laughs> like in that cartoon you showed earlier. <laughs> Absolutely. As an even more effective way of, of maybe exposing your, sin, your skin to the sun. <laughs> yeah. Or sin. Or your sin. Uh, Freudian slip, maybe. Um, and, and accumulating greater vitamin D effects. So I know that many of us were um, attending uh, the uh, Ectrams, the European MS meetings in Barcelona last week, and I know there were some presentations as well as some posters on vitamin D, and there have been a number of questions here today. Um, can anybody comment on what your current recommendations are for vitamin D in your practice, Dr. Bernard? So uh, in the fall, I, those of you who are my patients here might have heard this, you know, I, I asked my patients to understand and remember what dose of vitamin D you're taking. I think that seems kind of uh, simple, but there are so many different doses. Uh, it's important to know what dose you're on, and then, then we'll find out what dose you need to get the levels that we consider optimum. Um, I also ask my patients to make sure they have their exercise plan and also their flu shots, but that's sort of housekeeping in the fall, you know. Anyhow, so for, for vitamin D, I, I, we like a range of 50 to 60. That's kind of a, the range we look at. Um, not everyone is able to have a sort of a dose response based on whatever dose you're on to get that. So we do have to check levels. Um, your level, all of us, uh, by definition, in the upper Midwest are going to have lower levels in the, in the winter months. Um, so that's something that you might want to check uh, in the winter time to make sure it's in the optimum range. Um, it's just very difficult to obtain the adequate amount of vitamin D that you need by diet alone, so supplementation really is necessary. We haven't worked out what is the correct um, upper limit of dosing for vitamin D. There have been a few studies, uh, but I think that's still being worked out. But just when you think you've heard the last paper on vitamin D, there's another poster. There were several at um, Ectrams. You know, it's, it's pretty much all good, you know, delaying uh, the progression of disease, relapses, onset of disease. Um, cognition is a new thing, uh, not just for MS, but in general for older adults. Um, I mean, we could spend an hour in vitamin D, so I'm going to stop here. Yeah. I, would, I would agree that uh, we usually aim for a range of about 50 uh, for our patients if we, can, if we can get them there. Everybody metabolizes vitamin D differently. So some patients, it is very difficult to get there, even with mega doses of vitamin D. You'll sometimes hear doctors prescribe 50,000 international units uh, weekly as a dose to try to raise that level, um, and then a maintenance dose of somewhere around 2,000 uh, international units a, a, a day. But it, but everybody's everybody's different, so you do have to check those levels to see whether that's an adequate amount for you and whether that actually gets you to where you want. Our ranges, uh, different labs have different ranges, and so usually they start at about 30 is considered normal, but we really would like people closer to 50. Um, Dr. Model, um, you were talking about MS, and I'm trying to summarize a couple of questions here. Um, fit people or people who were more active seem to have less in the way of disability progression, and the question, or one of the questions that relates to um, would it be good to get my children involved in exercise to prevent them from developing MS? Hmm. That's a great question. I, I, I actually think there are a couple of good reasons for getting your children involved in, in being physically active. I, I think families that tend to be physically active together are more likely to stay physically active over time, so getting your kids physically active with you will help to reinforce your own physical activity behaviors and habits. Um, 
the data on whether or not physical activity prevents MS are, are not out there at all. Um, it's, it's something that we've been trying to figure out in these large um, epidemiological studies like the U.S. Physician Study or U.S. Nurses Study to try to understand whether or not levels of physical activity and exercise participation predict the rate of having MS or not, or the risk of having MS or not. So I'm not quite sure that the data are there to suggest that, that physical activity can stop MS from occurring in the first place or reduce the risk of it. The other thing I think that is really important to consider in, in getting your kids physically active is, is that's what I used to do before I started doing research on people with multiple sclerosis to studying exercise and physical activity in kids. And, and the data are really quite intriguing in the sense that physical activity and exercise in kids can actually speed up the development of the brain and different tracks and systems in the brain. And that has all sorts of benefits. And, and some of the data that one of my colleagues, Chuck Hillman, is creating shows that this translates into improvements in academic performance in children in school. And we all want our kids to do better in school, at least I do. Um, and so I think that there are lots of good reasons, but to link it with preventing the disease might be going a step too far. If I could just add, there is data on obesity in children and risk of MS, and so certainly it's provocative to think there may be a relationship between that and exercise and maybe modifying the risk. So perhaps we can have Dr. Wynn address this question, uh, several questions about the role of stem cell treatment in MS. So there is a lot of basic research going on in stem cell treatment in MS, and there are many types of stem cell trials going on now. The Hematologic Stem Cell Program Northwestern has been active for many years. There are two stem cell projects we're about to embark on. The first two trials are not in MS. One is in a head injury and one is in stroke, where we're the neurosurgeons are actually implanting the stem cells directly on the areas of damage, and we're following with MRI imaging techniques and physical examination over time, and then if that works, that may subsequently lead to an MS study. The studies are not initially being done in MS because it's a moving target, so first we're taking individuals with head injury or stroke with a fixed motor deficit and following them after transplantation. The reason why is in MS, if people do not get better, we can't really tell is the transplant simply not being effective, or are we simply treating a moving target? So that's a whole new type of stem cell treatments being done. The hemologic stem cell transplants, as I mentioned, it's being done in Northwestern. It's an ongoing study. And then, of course, the mesenchymal stem cell transplants, which have been given overseas for years. Uh, Dr. Rubin, why are MRIs done routinely on the brain instead of the whole central nervous system, since lesions can also be seen on the spinal cord? So um, I don't know that uh, I would agree that uh, that MRIs are done just on just on the brain um, as opposed to the spinal cord. Sometimes it depends on where your your symptoms are. So if you're having new symptoms and they seem referable to the brain, if they affect the eyes or, or um, um, seem to affect the face, arm, and leg, the most likely uh, place where that symptom could be coming from would be from the brain. But if symptoms seem to be involving just the legs or just the arms, it is important to actually look at the rest of the, the central nervous system, which is, includes the spinal cord, um, to get a good picture of where, where lesions are occurring. So um, while the, the brain is probably the most common place we see lesions, the spinal cord is a very important place for lesions and can lead to a lot of disability. You've got a very small area so that even a small lesion can have a big effect. So we don't want to ignore the spinal cord when patients are complaining of symptoms. But it, again, depends on what sort of symptoms patients are, are having. So depending on, on, on the, the situation and where you are, um, you know, in your clinical um, evaluation with your physician, they may go where the money is, you know, if, depending on where the symptoms are, you're going to look where the most likely place that those symptoms are occurring. But as you're assessing the patient as a whole and you want to know how they're doing, and especially if they're not having specific new symptoms, you do sometimes need to do the entire central nervous system to really look to see where new lesions are occurring. 
So, um, Dr. Motto, you, um, t I know, presented your uh, diagram or your picture of um, the uh, exercise promoting uh, BDNF or brain brain drive neurotrophic factor. We have several com questions here. Does exercise promote remyelination, and it can can it repair axons? Mm. Um, I, I'm not aware of any data out there that have tested the effects of exercise on remyelination or on repairing axons. It's something that um, we are, are starting to do at the University of Illinois with one of my colleagues in animal sciences looking at the effects of, of exercise on myelin or models of myelination and demyelination, particularly a, a model called the Cooper Zone model. Um, that is a model that, that strips the axons of myelination, and we're looking at whether or not exercise can slow down that process as well as potentially speed up uh, the rate at which the axons are remyelinated when uh, we're, we're done with the trial. So, but that's in animals, and, and, and it'll be a long stretch to see whether or not those data that are collected in animals ultimately can can be translated to human trials. So I think it's promising, it's just, uh, ooh, that, that would be great, but we're a long way from being able to comment really on that. Um, we'll address this one to Dr. Bernard. Can you comment on uh, p people getting uh, the flu shot, the regular versus the senior citizen flu shot, the shingles, and the pneumonia vaccine? So everyone is supposed to get a flu shot, you know that, right? But we recommend the killed, um, not the live virus. So you think there may be a slight risk of triggering an MS attack with the live virus. Um, and I've noticed that the American Academy of Pediatrics is also recommending the inactivated um, as well. They've changed their guidelines on that. Um, the Pneumovax um, is something that's just a standard guideline after age 65. Um, shingles uh, vaccination, um, I'm not a big fan of that because I worry about uh, uh, flare-ups. Also, the yellow fever uh, vaccination can trigger flare-ups. Um, so, and I would, you know, just mostly recommend you get your flu shot and then after 65, the Pneumovax and the guidelines for standard um, health care. We worry a little bit about efficacy of some vaccines in patients who are on disease-modifying therapies. Um, so that's something to think about, um, and that's look, being looked at on nearly all of the disease-modifying therapies. The new, um, if I can simply add on that a little bit, the present uh, varicella vaccine, the shingles vaccine, is a live virus vaccine, but there's a vaccine that should come out soon, which is a non-live virus vaccine for shingles. The present vaccine for shingles, which is live virus, decreases shingles only about one third, really prevents persistent or pain after shingles, post effect neuralgia. The new shingles vaccine decreases the chance of getting shingles more than 97% in the trial. And that's the, the, the present vaccine is the Merck vaccine, the Galaxo vaccine should come out in the next few months. And I think that may become a more standard recommendation when we'll have a non-live virus vaccine for shingles. And I just want to, was going to add that it, it, to some extent it depends on what medications you're on as well. So if you're on a medication that does suppress your immune system, you need to be much more careful with the live viruses than the, than the medications that, don't, uh, that are immune, immune modulating as opposed to immune suppressing. And so um, usually if somebody is on something that's immune modulating, I'm a little less concerned about the live viruses, but if they're on an immunosuppressing medication, then many of our newer drugs have a bigger impact on our, on our immune system and do suppress. And so those medications, I'm more concerned about the live virus uh, vaccines and that you really want to try to get those done before you start those medications if possible. Great. Um, questions about um, information on medical marijuana and MS? Dr. Uh, Wynn? Um, so uh, this is, I was on a blue ribbon panel just a few weeks ago with the person who wrote this law for the state of Illinois. The chief of police um, and one of the individuals who represents many of the um, dispensaries, there should be product in stores by mid-November. Um, the first, one of the first dispensaries will open, uh, or it was on TV, it looks like a few days ago, but there probably won't be product for another month or so. 
so there should be, be multiple varieties available, both uh, vapor, um, uh, edibles, so to speak, as well as a smokable product. Uh, there are good guidelines that have been put out by the American Neurology and others as to which symptoms of MS will may help. Certainly, spasticity, there's strong evidence for central neuropathic pain and pain in MS. It's good evidence. Um, whether or not, if you take a little bit too much, whether or not we'll encourage you to exercise, though, may be another question entirely. <laughs> so we may recommend you do it after your exercise. Um, there was some controversy. We talked about this a little bit last year at this meeting about high salt diet. There's some data raised on the question of high salt diet making MS worse. If that's the case, if you do go for the cannabis, I would watch the munchies. If I could just add also, there is data that suggests there is a downside to cannabis in terms of MS and cognition. So I think it's important to, to think that cannabis is, you know, cannabis also can have side effects, adverse effects, just like all the therapeutics that we prescribe for you. So please be aware that cognition is unfortunately one of the or in, in negative impacts on cognition is a potentially a complication of using cannabis therapy. Right, and um, I'll, I'll just add also fatigue. So, um, you know, can, it certainly can make you sleepy. And um, I always recommend to people, you know, there are sort of pros and cons. You can't use it and work. Um, there's still federal regulations against it, so if you work especially at a federal job and you could be uh, drug tested, you would fail that drug test, and so you need to consider that. Um, even having the card would not, would not um, necessarily protect you. Um, you also can't drive if you didn't use it, so this is something that ha definitely has some limitations in, in usability. Um, even though it may have some benefit, especially for pain and spasticity. So you really have to sort of weigh those pros and cons uh, when you consider whether you want to use uh, medical marijuana or not. There, there will be laws regarding um, being intoxicated from smoking mm -hmm. cannabis, but the law has very, very strong civil rights protections preventing people from being fired, mm -hmm. losing a job from using medical marijuana. If someone is using marijuana legally, um, Jobs are not allowed to discriminate against people. They'll not likely be allowed to smoke in the workplace, obviously. However, it's supposed to be smoked in one's home. The packages from the dispensaries cannot be opened until one gets home. Open package in the car is like having an open bottle of whiskey in the car. So you're not going to be allowed that. But employers are not allowed to discriminate against workers who use medical cannabis um, upon recommendation. Now, it's not a drug that a physician can prescribe. It's a it's a substance that a physician can testify it might benefit a person's condition, and the patient gets a card based upon that. Whether or not the person chooses to go ahead and go to a dispensary and purchase it is a whole separate issue, but it's not a prescribed drug. This is one of the reasons, for example, why you can't get it in the drugstore like the CVS, Carmark, Walgreens, uh, and or your mail-order pharmacy. And it's very unlikely your insurance is going to pay for it right, unless you find very unusual not insurance. I don't know, maybe about the health savings yeah. account. I haven't explored that yet. I don't know. Okay. Um, so we'll uh, go back to Dr. Bottle. We have a number of questions here that I'll try to put together. And basically, it's talking about MS in um, the more sedentary patients, people who are essentially using things like uh, scooters and, and wheelchairs on a, a most of the time basis. And even those who aren't, um, but haven't exercised in a while. How, what, is it ever too late to start? When can you start? How, what's some recommendations to getting back into it? So it, it, it's never too late to start exercising. I, I think the other thing to think about is, is regardless of your physical activity and exercise habits, it's, it's always a good thing to try to do a little bit more. Most of the data out there on physical activity and exercise, the dose response part of it is nicely worked out, and there are nice dose response data uh, as compared to vitamin D, which there aren't as nice data. Uh, when it comes to individuals who are in scooters or wheelchairs, um, one of my colleagues at, at the University of Illinois did a really intriguing study where he took individuals who could use a wheelchair, so scooter users or current wheelchair users, and helped them gain access to a high-quality, well-fitted wheelchair and then examined and gave them strategies for how to use that in everyday life. 
And what he found in, and I'm not fully describing the intervention, but what he essentially found is, is that by giving people with MS who are in, in a scooter or a wheelchair, a high quality, well-fitted wheelchair, teaching them how to propel it the right way, teaching them how to use it in everyday life, that these individuals would use it more than you could ever imagine. And that actually turned out to be one of their primary forms of physical activity. And in fact, the CDC has just created guidelines that in wheelchair users, wheeling is probably the best form of physical activity that they can engage in. And my colleague Ian showed that it had very nice outcomes from improving the strength of the upper body through improving feelings of fatigue and depression, as well as improving quality of life. So it looks like, and we're trying to develop this intervention a little bit more, and I should mention that that intervention was funded by the MS Society, since we're here as part of the MS Society. So there are good options. So in our practice, um, if people talk to us about wheelchairs or scooters, um, one of the first things we insist on is a seating evaluation yep. done by a certified seating specialist, usually a physical therapist, um, because if you end up with the wrong chair or the wrong scooter, you're, you're stuck with it for many years based on insurance regulations, unless you can afford to go out and buy a whole new one on your own. So nothing more important than getting a true seating evaluation done by a professional so that you get the right thing from the beginning. And then on top of that, teaching people how to propel it the right way so that you don't have shoulder injuries and, and things along those lines is, is critical. So a question for anyone on the panel, what's, uh, what are your thoughts about, or the word from Ekstrom's on biotin? Um, so that's good. Uh, there, I think several people in the room know that there's been some evidence suggesting that biotin may be beneficial in people with chronic progressive multiple sclerosis. There was a pilot paper that was presented from Europe of 23 patients suggesting some improvement. The major problem is the dose of biotin is approximately 10,000 times the dose you might get in biotin, let's say, in the health food store. Mm -hmm. um, when you take biotin at a level like that, it's not, you're not getting a uh, vitamin value amount, but you're getting a chemical effect of a drug. There are, um, now, I know there are people who are getting the drug compounded now and using it that way. I just, would, as a researcher, I'd recommend a little bit of caution. There are some side effects. High-dose biotin clearly decreases responsivity to insulin and increases blood sugar in many individuals. Uh, there are some people who get significant uh, skin rashes from high doses of biotin. Uh, there, it affects absorption of vitamin C and vitamin B6, which are, of course, very important for many bodily functions. In getting medications compounded, there have been, uh, unfortunately, several <coughs> very embarrassing issues that have occurred from compounding pharmacies across the that have been shut down because of the ways in which medication was put together and what people were actually getting. So um, there are two ongoing double-blind trials with high-dose biotin now. And for people who are interested in learning this, I recommend you talk to the, those of us involved in these trials so you can find out, might this be a medication to be appropriate for you? But again, at the dose that is being given in chronic progressive mass is much, much different dose than, let's say, I might have gone to the store and bought for hair growth which didn't do me much good either. <laughs> Any other comments? Are you, Dr. Bernard or Dr. Rubin, are you recommending it? Or? So I'm not recommending it yet, although I'm not opposed if people want to get compounded um, uh, biotin. I, I have given them prescriptions for it, but I think the, the data is still too preliminary to really recommend it. I mean, it's exciting that something that's a readily available um, uh, vitamin could be possibly helpful for progressive MS, especially since we have so little um, right now. Although I will say at Ectrams, that was a big focus of, um, uh, of, the, of the conferences on um, uh, uh, drugs that may have potential benefit in progression. So we're beginning to see a lot more research in progressive disease, and I think that's that's an exciting and a very unmet need in multiple sclerosis that is finally being being addressed. So I think we're, we're going to get some data in the in the near future that may be very helpful for our patients with with progressive disease. Um, but as of now, I'm I, I'm not opposed to people trying it. 
but I'm, I'm not strongly recommending it because I think the data is still too preliminary. I, I would agree uh, for people interested in treatments for progressive forms of MS, secondary progressive, primary progressive, in breakout session H this afternoon, I'll be discussing that. Mm -hmm. As some of you may know, we had a sort of a breakthrough announcement just a couple weeks ago with the first drug, ogrelizumab, that showed a positive effect in a double-blind, mm -hmm. placebo-controlled trial in primary progressive MS. So, again, there are 20, there are 13 drugs presently FDA approved in relapsing forms of MS, and this drug will go to the FDA first quarter of this next year, perhaps be the first drug FDA approved in even primary progressive MS in addition to relapsing MS, ocrelizumab. So I, I would also like to add that um, several people in my practice are um, taking biotin, uh, the compounded forms of biotin, and I would also remind you to be buyer beware. I have one gentleman who has gotten his compounded uh, biotin for $185 a month, and my other uh, person who is taking it has gotten it for $95 a month. So in compounded substances, there is no regulation in terms of pricing, so be mindful of that. But as Dr. Wynn said, also be mindful of who's actually compounding your medication. Uh, for many years, people were taking a lot of compounded medications before we had disease-modifying therapies. And I used to tell people, you know, they would say, oh, is this good or is that good or whatever? And I would say, well, compounded medication is kind of like bathtub gin. You never know what you're going to get, but it could be pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, looks like we're about to uh, finish up with one last question, and I think we'll address this to Dr. Model, and that is there have been a number of questions here um, about too much exercise. Um, about people that have found themselves exercising to the point where um, they push themselves into spasms. Um, and sort of the second part of these multiple questions um, is if you exercise too much, can you actually increase inflammation and ultimately worsen your MS? This is a very good question. Um, so. I think one of the most important things that you have to learn if, if you want to engage in, in physical activity and exercise is a very simple principle of, of listening and learning from what your body tells you. If you do something and it causes you substantial worsening, you have to listen to that as a signal to say, my body isn't responding well and I need to try something else. Um, there are lots of different ways to engage in exercise and physical activity and not the same modality works the same way in all individuals. So if you have a negative consequence of exercising, such as spasticity, which is a real one, try a different type of exercise. Or try to break up the exercise maybe into two sessions at different times of the day. If you find that if I exercise for 30 minutes and I end up with spasms, try to do 15 minutes in the morning and 15 minutes in the afternoon. From a health perspective, that has the same health benefits and maybe the benefit is you're, you're also avoiding the deleterious consequences, for example, spasticity. Um, could exercising too much uh, actually uh, promote an inflammatory response? There are data out there uh, regarding this topic, not in MS, but in the general population of individuals who run marathons. I don't think that that's what we're promoting. That is, after individuals run marathons, they do have a very profound inflammatory response, and they're more prone to illnesses. One of my graduate students just ran the Chicago Marathon last weekend, and, and on Tuesday morning, she woke up with a cold, and that's a very, very common occurrence. But we're not talking about trying to get people with MS to, the general person with MS, to engage in enough physical activity that's equivalent to running a marathon. We're trying to get people with MS to engage in 30 to 40 minutes of physical activity five or more days a week, or to meet the physical activity guidelines that I shared with you. And I think that's a volume of physical activity that's not inflammatory, that actually uh, in, in older adults has shown anti-inflammatory effects. Great, thank you. At this point, I'll just ask if, um, if you have final comments or uh, things you'd like our, our audience members to consider for each one of our panel members, Dr. Rubin. No, I'd like to, first of all, thank you all for coming and for listening so attentively and, and asking such great questions. It shows that, that you're interested in your own health and 
and that you find uh, programs like this uh, uh, important and, and we appreciate um, your all being here. I think that uh, I'm a big proponent of exercise for my patients. I want my patients know that exercise, exercise, and exercise, no matter what the condition is, is usually the answer to, to most questions and especially in multiple sclerosis. So I think this was a, a, a great topic uh, this year for the research symposium because I think that exercise can be so helpful for all of our patients. And so we want to encourage everybody to uh, to participate in, in some exercise and find something you like to do and do it regularly. I think what I'd like to ask is actually something for Dr. Model. We know that the Hubbard Street Dance uh, Company has partnered with the Parkinson's Foundation to do um, Parkinson's uh, dance exercise sessions. It's a, it's a great experience for my patients with Parkinson's. And I'm just wondering, have you been approached by the Hubbard Street company and is that something, I think there'd be a lot of interest for our MS patients and it would be aerobic and it would be a really fabulous um, partnership. What do you think about that? I love it. Let's do it. Okay. Let's try to figure out how to make that connection. I, I will tell you that the MS Society just funded uh, a faculty member on our campus, Raleigh Lope Lo Lopez Hernandez, who is uh, doing a study on ballet and its effects on ataxia in particular in MS. So, cool. so there is a groundswell of interest, but let's figure it out. That would be okay. great. Thank you. Dr. Wynn? Um, I really appreciate everyone coming today. I hope, like myself, I know I'm very, very grateful for the strong efforts of volunteers such as yourself around the country, around the world, the National MS Society, really the largest funder of research for multiple sclerosis, making events like today possible for people living with MS, their family members, and for us slowly moving to having MS stand for mystery solved. Exercise is one of those things I know sometimes I procrastinate about. The only thing I sometimes don't procrastinate off is putting things off. We <laughs> want to really come and improve the guidelines that Dr. Marl has talked about. And as such, at our center, I know we have a program, several programs going on to try to bring some of this research from Champaign-Urbana up here to the community for people living with MS to try to develop an individualized exercise program. And, you know, please find myself or my staff members, several of whom are here sitting in the front, who are doing these programs both as part of their doctoral program uh, and or as part of the activities that go on in our MS center. So again, really very much thank you for all of your support and again, Again, tagging on to something that was brought up when the meeting started, of course, I think we all know what's happening in Chicago or, uh, tonight, the first game of the World Series for the Cubs, and of course, if the Cubs win the World Series, it will be very meaningful for us because it will mean the end of multiple sclerosis. <laughs> <laughs> We're, we've made right. advancements in MS, and we may have a Cy Young Award winner in Jake Arrieta, but if the Cubs win the World Series, it means there are no more MS because we know which is more likely will cure MS this fall than the Cubs will in the World Series this fall. But I'm very optimistic and hoping for both. And I know what the exercise that Dr. Muddle has taught the Cubs to do that, you know, we're way on our way. So again, thank you very much. Thank you. How do you follow that? <laughs> um, I. I I just want to keep it really simple, and, and the simple message is thank you for allowing me to have the privilege of being part of your lives. Thank you so much. Well, thank you to all of our panel members. I do have an entire stack of questions here that I will be handing over to uh, Colleen Friedman, who um, works very diligently to get these answers answered and put up and posted on the